Hello and welcome back to the Center for Critical and Cultural Theory. My name is Dr. Roger Green. This is part of a broader series of lectures um, for an introduction to critical theory. We are reading Carl Schmitt's Political Theology. I'm, I'm well aware that Carl Schmitt is not normally thought of as a critical theorist, um, but at this point in our uh, course, we're looking at Schmitt and then we will look at Vladimir Lenin after Schmitt so that Schmitt gives us an account of the further right and that uh, um, Lenin gives us uh, an account of the further left uh, uh, on the two sides of, of this, this liberal democracy that's inhabiting the Weimar Republic in Germany during the early 1920s when the Institute for Social Research emerges in Frankfurt. Um, political theology, the text here, was published in 1922 as well. And then we get to see um, from the further left and the further right uh, what's at stake for the early critical theorists of the Frankfurt School. Um, also, of course, I'm using political theology because Schmidt, an interest in Schmidt has re-emerged in the 21st century. So he's a good figure to know in these concepts, to, no matter what your politics are, um, where you um, align yourself, uh, Schmidt becomes somebody who... Uh, um, is good to know, and um, even if uh, it is to refute him, if that if that those are your politics. Um, so as usual, I'm going to pull up my notes, share them with you. I might have to edit some of them or just correct um, like typos as I carry on here. I, I share the script to keep myself on track, um, and. Uh, uh, sometimes I'm I, I'm still working things out. So if I jump in here, um, the thing to note is that political theology, this chapter is probably the most famous, it's the most crucial chapter, I think, of this book. Um, other than that first line that opens the entire book that says the sovereign is the one who decides on the state of exception, which we covered in an earlier lecture, um, uh, this first opening paragraph of chapter three is going to be repeated Oftentimes in scholarship, I've used it many times. It's oftentimes used when people are first starting to explain to people what political theology is, um, which is, of course, the bigger discourse. goes back to St. Augustine, but if, but in the past 20 years or so, there's a there was a journal. It was called Political Theology. Um, then there was a kind of website I used to do a lot of editing for um, and writing for as well, um, Political uh, theology today, and then that became the Political Theology Network, which is out there and exists, and they put on conferences and publish books and things like that. Um, uh, so uh, we want to get we want to focus in a little bit on on Schmidt's particular sense of what he means by political theology here. So as I say here, jumping in the first paragraph of this essay warrants repeating, although I already re referenced it in a previous lecture. All significant concepts of the modern theory of the state are secularized religious concepts, not only because of their historical development in which they were transferred from theology to the theory of the state, whereby, for example, the omnipotent God became the omnipotent lawgiver, but also because their, of their systematic structure, the recognition of which is necessary for a sociological consideration of these concepts. The exception in jurisprudence is analogous to the miracle in theology. Only by being aware of this analogy can we appreciate the manner in which the philosophical ideas of the state developed in the last centuries." End quote there. Okay, so that is a dense paragraph, a lot to unpack there. Um, so first of all, he's saying that at the base of all modern theories of the state, and of course their legal systems are implicated here, um, are theological ideas that have become secularized. Uh, then he says they were transferred from theology, from the God as omnipotent lawgiver, um, uh, or um, omnipotent God becomes omnipotent lawgiver. Um, but also he says, um, because of their systematic structure. And this is 
he says he says we need to recognize this for a sociological consideration of the concepts so he's going to use that word sociological consideration a lot in this chapter he's already been using it in the book and it's a loaded term for him because sociology as a science has arisen in the late 19th century along with other social sciences like psychology um, and they have followed general scientific method, I'm going back to thinkers like Auguste Comte, um, of scientific positivism, right? So if you think about what positivism is, um, through empirical scientific method, you have to be able to repeat the same experiment over and over again, right? So the verification of truth is based on... Um, uh, the repetition of the same experiment and producing the same results, right? So it's external. That's what he means. It's not positive, like thumbs up. It's positive, like it's positive in the world, posited in the world. And that's the same sense of where um, legal positivism comes from and sociological positivism comes from. And that's why Max Weber, who's a sociologist, keeps showing up in uh, Carl Schmitt's book right here, because of course he's a famous sociologist. So uh, Schmidt sees himself as participating in that, but he is correcting and critiquing at the same time this entire turn towards scientism, which he associates with liberalism, which he associates with democracy, and to a lesser extent, constitutionalism. Um, uh, but liberal democracies tend to have constitutions. Um, so um, next sentence, the exception in jurisprudence is analogous to the miracle in theology. Um, there is a political, a theological political tractatus that was written in the late 17th century by Baruch Spinoza, the Jewish thinker, um, really important, uh, treatise in the formation of liberalism. Um, although what happened was, what, in, in my reading anyway, is that, is that the classic liberal uh, theorists like John Locke, um, uh, especially John Locke, um, really are reacting negatively to him. And he's not the only one. So, so uh, Spinoza makes a lot of people mad, including his own Jewish community during his lifetime. And one of the things that he says in the political theological treatise is that um, there may have been a time earlier in human history where uh, God made appearances in the world. Call it like biblical times, for example, where God shows up to Moses. But we are no longer in those times anymore. God has receded from the world and we live in a strictly historical, linear, temporal um, kind of temporality uh, for Schmidt or sorry, for um, Spinoza. Now for Schmidt, Schmidt really dislikes that, right? Because like the, he sees that as exactly part of the problem that um, the exception, which is associated with the sovereign, who is associated with God, who is associated with miracles, if we're ejecting all of that from the world, um, then we're missing something fundamental for Schmidt. Um, so a lot of uh, anti-Semitists um, or anti-Jewish folks um, uh, and 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 many of the Euro Christians are just they're they're anti Jewish, just from their Euro Christian disposition, especially during Baruch Spinoza's um, lifetime. Uh, despite the fact that he's writing in the Netherlands and that, that there are a lot more liberal ideas sort of forming there, um, the, which allows him to sort of publish to begin with. Um, uh, Euro-Christian thinkers tend to read Spinoza as being overly materialist. And you can hear the connotations um, uh, for Jewish stereotypes that might go along with those types of charges. Um, and so I th think that uh, uh, by emphasizing that the miracle is related to the state of exception, I think that we should like like have a little bit in mind or just, just be aware that Spinoza had said something radically different um, and would be uh, an opponent. And um, it's not the fact that like everybody accepted Spinoza, but I think that because people reacted to Spinoza, um, the way that classic liberalism developed, um, uh, it developed partly by pushing against, you know, uh, um, monarch monarchism, but also 
by pushing back um, against thinkers like um, Spinoza, who, who, whom they're indebted to, um, if you ask me. And the Euro-Christians are certainly indebted to, to Spinoza and, and liberalism as well. So uh, Schmidt says, only by being aware of like this miracle in theology can we give an appreciation of, um, of uh, appreciate the manner in which the philosophical ideas of the state developed in the past few centuries. And so what he's going to try and give us is um, a, a sociological consideration of sovereignty. Um, he's going to talk about it in terms of miracles, and he is going to call that kind of thing that he is describing political theology, as he will say at the end of this chapter, um, that like political theology means if we're looking at political theology of a certain epoch, we are trying to understand the metaphysics that are generally understood, the conception of reality that's generally stood at a understood at a particular historical moment in time. And of course, by going through this history, he's going to tell us what he thinks is missing, which is that concept of sovereignty that he's been arguing throughout the book. So digging into my my notes here, um, the modern, according to Schmidt, of course, the modern uh, state was supported by a metaphysics of de deism that, quote, banished the miracle from a theory of state. In addition to rejecting God's intervention in the form of the miracle, deism rejected the intervention of the sovereign in a legal order. Enlightenment rationalism rejected the exception at every turn. Counter-revolutionary conservative Catholic ph philosophers, however, were able to draw meaningful analogies to the sovereign and the exception because their theology and ideology supported it. So Schmidt saves a detailed account of miracles for another time. That's why I kind of had that little diatribe about Spinoza a few minutes ago. Um, in the past decade, scholars such, of, such as Hent de Vries have um, explored the question of miracles in more depth. And I think they did a school of or Cornell School of Criticism course on that, maybe 2012. Um, uh, Schmidt goes on to say that many foundational aspects of jurisprudence derive from theology. He also says that any in-depth inquiry will show that far from existing in the instrumentalized objective law, of legal positivism or the neo-Kantian liberals like Kelsen who identify the law with the state, the state constantly makes interventions, according to Schmidt, that show that it is not reducible to law alone. Scientific positivists love to poke fun at theologians, but no one, but, but excuse me, but one needs to take a deeper look historically, um, according to Schmidt. He says, quote, I readily admit that because of an inability to master intellectually contradictory arguments or objections, some jurists introduce the state in their works by a mental or sh mental short circuit, just as certain metaphysicians misuse the name of God. But this does not yet resolve the substantive problem. And that's going to be a loaded word here that he doesn't really give a lot of background on, but he understands substance in the sense of the scholastics. Um, so this would be going back to much earlier late medieval um, Catholic thought, particularly Thomas Aquinas. Um, and he's going to say that Descartes has a shift away from, from that, or has a different understanding. Of course, Descartes tried in his first meditations uh, or meditations on first philosophy, Descartes thinks that he is solving problems that were related, related to the scholastics. Um, it depends on your reading of Descartes, whether or not he really gets beyond his own dogmatism, he does not get beyond it for me because he is just further entrenching himself into Euro-Christian uh, worldview, as I and my friend Tink Tinker use the term. Um, but uh, we're not doing a reading of of uh, uh, Rene Descartes in this class. So I'm just saying that that's, a, that's what's happening here, is that there's going to be competing um, definitions of substance here um, and some some other late medieval thinkers that might be important. Um, Occam might come up. Um, uh, maybe somebody else. Um, uh, Duns Scotus definitely comes up 
um, in rejections, and that's where the dunce cap comes from, actually. That, that, um, but uh, uh, dunce goddess is going to be, I think, the way if you're if you were comparing to Heidegger, um, Heidegger does a lot of work on dunce goddess and logic and his um, reactions to um, Aquinas's logic. So that that's kind of that is just a philosophical discussion that's in the background here. Um, liberal legal theorists, according to Schmidt. Um, so theorists such as Proust, um, who, of course, remember, was one of the writers for the Weimar Constitution. Le liberal legal theorists such as Proust constantly attack their opponents for remaining adherence to theological ideas such as the divine right of kings. Kelsen rejects revelation in the theory of the modern state. But Mer Bernatzik says that the organic theory of the modern state is precisely theological. Schmidt then praises Kelsen's work, recent work since 1920 for explicitly making analogies between jurisprudence and theology. Schmidt says that by doing so, Kelsen allowed thinkers of intellectual history insight into the break with theology brought about by the neo-Kantian legal positivism. He says that this is also in line with the thought of John Stuart Mill. Of course, another classic liberal thinker, right? Um, the problem, again, for Schmidt here is that in their, these liberals attempt to frame an objective and scientific analysis, they eradicate the entire idea of the exception. So with respect to Kelsen, quote, at the foundation of his identification of state and legal order rests a metaphysics that identifies the lawfulness of nature and normative lawfulness. This pattern is character characteristic of the natural sciences. It is based on a rejection of all quote, arbitrariness, and attempts to banish from the realm of the human mind every exception. He claims that by accepting Humes and Kant's critique of the concept of substance, um, uh, uh, their critique of, uh, a critique of substance rests at their foundation of the state, but then complains that they miss the mark of how the scholastics thought it, going back to Aquinas. This, of course, shows a tension between Protestant and Catholic Euro-Christians, which he says is entirely different from mathematical or natural scientific thinking. Summing up his critique of Kelsen's turn towards democracy, Schmidt says, quote, democracy is the expression of a political relativism and a scientific orientation that are liberated from miracles and dogmas and based on human understanding and critical doubt, end quote. Schmidt turns back to the to back to a sociological account of sovereignty, saying that it's necessary because a sociology of legal concepts alone uh, presupposes a consistent and radical ideology. Radical here, as George Schwab, the translator, tells us in his note, means thought out to the end. So he's not like not like radical revolutionaries. It's like it's like thought taken to its logical conclusion. Um, Schmidt then characterizes two opposing ends of spiritualist and materialist accounts of history. These would both be examples of radical thought for him. Following Max Weber, he characterizes restoration thought as spiritualists. What he means here is that the counter-revolution um, uh, characterized the French Revolution as a result of the enlightenment of enlightenment thought which had changed people's ways of thinking and their politics. Such an account is spiritual, in quotes here, because a change of perception is articulated as the premise for outward action. For my American students, you might notice that Phenomenology of Spirit, which is a book of Hegel's, is sometimes translated into English as Phenomenology of Mind. So you might think of mind and spirit um, uh, together here that, we're, that, that some, when they're talking about something spiritual, it might be just something like psychological in terms of spirit and not necessarily otherworldly in terms of spirit. Um, so uh, people have given accounts of the Enlightenment that Enlightenment thought somehow gave a shift in consciousness, which then allowed for the French Revolution to happen. And so the spiritual nature of that would be the shift in thought coming first. 
Marxist materialism, of course, countered this by claiming that such conditions were merely the ideological construction of bourgeois rationality. He therefore stressed the need for an economic analysis of history and was suspicious of psychological explanations for change. Schmidt sees Marx as pointing out the implicit irrationalism of Enlightenment and idealistic claims that rationality can give an account for of the vitality of human life. Um, uh, so again, like uh, if we go back to my Marx lectures from a few weeks ago, um, Marx and Engels are saying that um, uh, idealism as a philosophy ends up being um, just kind of the ideological um, outgrowth of the fact that um, bourgeois uh, people are in power and that re enlightenment thought, especially the enlightenment reason, because idealism actually tries to critique a little bit of that enlightenment reason um, uh, and, and have, uh, have an account for the irrational. But enlightenment reason especially is especially bourgeois for Marx because um, it tries to give a complete rational account of everything, but in its internalization, it forgets, according to Marx's reading, that all History is the history of class struggle over actual material things. So he takes the opposite direction, right? Um, so Schmidt sees Marx as pointing out the implicit irrationalism of the Enlightenment and idealist claims that rationality can give an account of the vitality of human life. That is a loaded term here. And Schmidt's mind, it's, it's interesting where he goes as a writer here. He says, he then notes that George Sorrell, um, an anarchist, um, used the same approach to critique Henry Bergson's vitalism. Bergson is, of course, a really, really important French philosopher from the late 19th, early 20th century, um, who gave an account of uh, creative evolution, which is one of his books, Time and Memory, um, was another one of his books. And he's drawing on Darwinian thought and evolutionary theory, but trying to give uh, um, a different account of some, some kind of directionality um, uh, towards the way that our cells um, move and, 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 and where human thought moves. I'm not going to be able to give a really good account of it right now in this lecture, um, but his term vitalism, um, it's related to the motivation of life, right? Um, and motivation for life is going to be at the basis of psychological endeavors, right? Psychologists study when, when somebody's depressed, they have no motivation. There's nothing to keep pushing them going. Mm -hmm. um, for biologists, when they're talking about vitality, we're talking about sex drives. We're talking about the, the perpetuation of the species, right? Um, and of course, species being goes back to Feuerbach from an earlier essay. Um, and so we could take that in the biological post-Darwinian sense, um, or a more philosophical interpretation of that, like in, in Nietzsche's uh, genealogy of morals. He's using the language of genealogy and the language of evolutionary biology, but he's talking about morality itself, right? Um, okay, so for Schmidt, then, um, uh, the problem of both the spiritualist um, or the Enlightenment accounts, um, and the materialist or the Marxian accounts of history, is that they both seek, end up falling back on only seeking causal relations. To me, Roger here giving this talk, um, this is Schmidt's veiled critique of dialectical thinking altogether, whether Marxian or Hegelian. Um, I think that he has an allergy towards dialectical thought. And that's important because the critical theorists are going to really critique dialectical thought as well. So Horkheimer and Adorno in their book, Negative Dialectics, or um, in their um, uh, uh, the big critique of the Enlightenment, um, uh, they are going to take their version of dialectical thinking to task. And of course, Hegelians push back on that sort of um, their their account of Hegelianism. Um, but I'm going to say that this is a point of possible alignment between the critical theorists of the Frankfurt School and Schmidt here. Um, sociology, uh, Schmidt says, results in the same thing, where we're just talking about cause and effect. Um, uh, Schmidt calls this a caricature and then gives an example of attributing the success of relativity theory to the currency relations in the world market. 
So again, he's like, and this is like, it's very weird, these few sentences here to me, the way he jumps from, from Marx to um, anarchist thought to Bergson um, and now to throwing in relativity theory, relativity theory, which of course is Einstein, um, and then uh, relating that to the currency relations in the world market, which of course is a kind of chaos, so the kind of, there's a kind of relativity um, uh, there as well. Schmidt, um, uh, so see, he says, this is the problem when we take, when we, when we take these positivistic approaches and then we start trying to apply them to like sociological concepts, then we have the wrong attribution of things. We attribute the enlightenment, um, to a shift in consciousness that then produce like a philosophical shift in consciousness that then produces the conditions of the enlightenment. Uh, uh, and, and so, uh, uh, it's, this is like this is a really interesting part to me as just as, as a reader and, and, uh, under trying to understand how Schmidt is putting this all together as a writer. Um, Schmidt critiques Max Weber's sociological account of law. Um, what we might think of in more recent terms as the social construction of law through actors, cumulative actions by claiming so uh, so schmidt critiques this by claiming that sociology's emphasis on concepts reduces it to psychology so that's the problem right so schmidt doesn't like sociology because he says it reduces actual historical events to just psycho psychological endeavors like a shift in consciousness and the enlightenment rash rational thought that then produces the um uh the the french revolution now, um, the flip side of that, of course, is Marx. Is Marx is going to say no? All that, that, all of that, like philosophical thought, was really about the ideological constructions um, of the support of the bourgeoisie, and maybe the idealists, if they critique that and account for the more of the irrational, they're opening up slowly through history. They're opening up more of an account of of what might become the the raised consciousness that would produce the proletariat class for Marx, right? Um, if uh, Hegel is about the master to slave dialectic on an individual basis, Feuerbach and Marx are about the um, the the realization of the proletarian class as an entire class on a social basis. And but it's that same sort of maneuver where freedom is sort of emerges through the dialectical process through a kind of self-recognition. Um, Schmidt, coming back to Schmidt here, Schmidt warns against confusing a sociological problem with a sociological concept, and that then complains that liberal analytical methods introduce a kind of discourse relative or a discursive relativism um, of different spheres, or what some more recent rhetoricians have called discourse communities. Um, where we talked about the language of law, like the jargon that we associated with lawyers or the jargon that we associate with basketball. Um, uh, and we analyze the ways that um, those might not be completely discrete, separate communities, but they give us a sense of the way that discourse works within a community that gels it together. Schmidt hates that kind of thing, right? He sees that as part of relativism. He sees that as kind of a breakdown of philosophical truth. Um, he's kind of Hobbesian in that way. You hear like Hobbes and Locke in the beginnings of their, their big treatises, like lamenting uh, the, the fluid nature of language itself. Um, so he wants a more fixed kind of language um, to attribute a fixed kind of truth. Um, so uh, Schmidt then illustrates the absurdity what he thinks of this is absurdity by, by reducing Hegel. To, he says, this is like talking about Hegel and saying that uh, um, Hegel, Hegel's philosophy is the philosophy of the professional lecturer. And Kelsen um, is the just the ideology of the lawyer bureaucrat, um, the result of which may be the reduction of legal thought to literary criticism. He says, if we just say that philosophy is just like, this is just how philosophical lecturers in bourgeois universities talk, um, then it has no attachment to truth claims anymore, right? If we reduce all law um, to the ideology of the lawyer bureaucrat, who's the specialist, who's the expert, 
um, what somebody might call like in more the conservatives today might call this the liberal elite, um, then uh, we get a, a kind of insular discourse, um, but there's no more attachment to truth. And so you might be calling it law, but it might as well be literary criticism, according to Schmidt. So one can easily imagine that Schmidt would make similar charges against current day identity politics, which came up in an earlier lecture for me um, when I was lecturing on Marx. Remember how I brought us into the, the present with um, identity politics in the 21st century, a big part of university culture, a big part of battles, ideological, political battles in the United States today. Um, and uh, oftentimes the right wingers will say um, uh, when you are trying to, uh, when when somebody's advocating that we think of, uh, that we respect one person's identity, or one, uh, say, I don't know, the uh, the, ex the African-American experience as a discrete sort of thing uh, that is unknowable to people who are not African-Americans, um, the right, the, the easy go-to um, critique for, for the right-wingers there is going to be, you are being divisive. This is just divisiveness. Um, of course, to the people on the conventional left, this is going to be like, uh, 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 no, you have to respect difference. We have to have diversity, equity, and inclusion, things like that. Um, for Marxists on the, on the far left, and this is why I brought it up in my earlier lecture, from the, the far left, they're going to say all of that internal gender division, um, racial um, division has been something that's been introduced by bourgeois society in order to make competing identity claims that prevent us from aligning together on the basis of a proletarian mass, which would see no difference between color and see no uh, um, uh, no reason to subject uh um uh women to gender differences and and i you know at least theoretically although it wasn't on marx's map would be um accepting of trans people and and um why not right uh so um both sides on the extremes maneuver towards a kind of uh dissolution of the identity categories that are important to current day liberalism, which is why I think they become part of such a big part of the critique or why Ron DeSantis in Florida says we that he he doesn't want to have state funding go to any kind of diversity, equity, and inclusion um, in education, in public education, right? So this is just one of the battles. So a way to understand where like in a in a deeper way for us um as critical theorists where some of that very um present the discourse in our in our society might be coming from um so yeah i think that schmidt would would um would 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 uh well, probably align closer to Ron DeSantis in today's uh, stuff, or DeSantis might align with Schmidt. I don't know that he reads Schmidt, but um, a true sociolo sociology of a concept then for Schmidt is not going to be just purely spiritualist or materialist. In contrast, it would alone, quote, have the possibility of achieving a scientific result for a concept such as sovereignty. It's just interesting that he's appealing to science because he's so critical of scientism, right? So Schmidt thinks his analysis, which, quote, transcends juridical conceptualization oriented to immediate practical interest, will avoid the traps expressed by radicalized spiritual or material analyses. He wants to establish, quote, proof of two spiritual, but at the same time, substantial identities. And remember, he's using that word substance in this kind of allusion, in, in his mind anyway, to, to Aquinas or the scholastic thought. He proceeds with sovereignty then as his sociological concept. So he's going to try and prove something more sociologically sound than the, socio the liberal sociologists like Weber. Um, by using the method of political theology and by um, using the concept of sovereignty as his uh, point um, of uh, uh, explanation here. <laughs>
rather than a psychological spirit being, quote, mirrored from a Cartesian concept of God or derived from an economic condition, conditions or vice versa, the true sociological concept of sovereignty for Schmidt can be seen, quote, when the historical political status of the monarchy of that epoch is shown to correspond to the general state of consciousness that was characteristic of Western Europeans at that time, and when the juristic construction of the historical political reality can find a concept whose structure is in accord with the structure of metaphysical concepts. Monarchy thus becomes a self becomes as self-evident in the consciousness of that period as democracy does in a later period. So here again, he's not just like claiming, let's go back to the 17th century. He is giving an account of history, but he says that when we give an account of history from the perspective of political theology, where we try and look at the general metaphysics of a particular situation, we can see that monarchy belongs to the 17th century and democracy belongs to the 20th century. Um, in other words, quote, the metaphysical image of that, that a definite epoch forges of the world has the same structure as what the world immediately understands to be appropriate as a form of its political organization. He says, quote, metaphysics is the most intensive and clearest expression of an epoch. Of course, part of the irony here is that Schmidt is writing just after what philosophers have sometimes called the death of metaphysics, oftentimes attributed to uh, um, to sayings such as Nietzsche's death of God, as I alluded to earlier in this talk. Another way to think of it, and I didn't put it into my notes here, but if you're reading the chapter, at this point in the text, Schmidt will refer obliquely to phenomenological method, right, which is a recent discourse in um, philosophy for his time. So he's got that, he's got the philosophical discourse on his mind, right? Um, uh, um, and that Berg, Bergson came up. So Bergson is associated with phenomenology early on. Um, Husserl in Germany would be um, associated with it. Um, Heidegger has just started lecturing. And so I think he's been doing his like lectures on Aristotle, the basic um, lectures on Aristotle at this point, but Heidegger has yet to um, write his magnum opus, right? Um, being in time is not going to show up till the late 1920s here. But phenomenology is going on. And what phenomen phenomenologic me phenomenological method does is it introduces this thing called the epoche, the phenomenological reduction, which says we're going to bracket that mind mind world or um, problem that's been part of the philosophical um, discussion, as, at least since Descartes, which says that we can only know what's going on conceptually in the world because we can only have conceptual ideas um, uh, that are that are bound to the apparatus of our thoughts and our brains. So yes, we might be embodied, we might be in a world, but we can't know the world as it really is, as Kant says. Right, so there's this kind of radical separation from the world. Um, Leibniz, or um, or sorry, not Leibniz, um, Barclay, George Barclay will go on to say that all we have is something like mind. Right, that's all we have access to. Like we're living in God's virtual reality. It's not to say that God doesn't exist. It's just that we can never know the true God. We can never know the true world because we're trapped as humans in our own sort of uh, mental cognitive stuff. Uh, phenomenological method brackets that discussion. So the competing claim would be the empiricists, right? Who are in England, especially, who are saying, no, all we can know is the stuff that is actually in the world. The Marxists who say that, no, we need to do economic analysis of material conditions to produce solid science. From that, we is how we can base our, our notions of truth and 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 reality itself phenomenological method tries to bracket that question by understanding the affective waves um and articulations of how thought and um emotion and psychologism works in its kind of reality itself um so uh uh yeah, I, th I think that that's important. Um, 
uh, that Schmidt, if it like, and it's important to see that Schmidt thinks he's doing something in line with phenomenology and the way that he's presenting his political theology, if that makes sense. Um, so the problem, again, back to Schmidt here, the problem with deist rational versions of God during the Enlightenment is that according to Cartesian thought, the immediately the immediate result of a prince is of a prince trying to mimic God's logic, um, which produces that which says like basically says that the 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 awareness of um uh when the prince is trying to mimic God's logic, what gets produced is the awareness of the prince's own limitations. Whereas before and maybe the earlier time, the monarchical time that Schmidt is pointing to, the prince conducts the state as God conducts creation, which is something that happens continually. And this architect of the world was in the earlier times also a legislator. But the enlightenment time, because it says that all we are is rationality, like as Descartes says, as Kant says, we cannot know the infinity of God, all we are become awareness, be, all, be, all we become aware of is our internal limited conceptualized systems. This is why Descartes thinks that he's proved the existence of God because he's proven the fact that he is imperfect and finite in relation to a much more powerful being. And that powerful being, and again, Descartes's, Descartes's <laughs> uh, view is that... Um, that 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 a, a true God would never do bad, would never do anything wrong, um, too. And so, if that true God is never going to do harm to the world, uh, which is God's creation, then the sovereign prince is never going to really do harm to the people, because the, the, the sovereign prince is going to be treating the people as if the people are um, uh, uh, his children or his creation itself. Um, but if you, what legal positivism and what um, the, the deism and the scientific turn tries to do is it removes the exception, which is at the core of the prince's ability um, and produces just like uh, uh, a kind of machine-like system. So as Schmidt, as Schmidt goes on here, he says, scientific thinking in the 18th century permeated the political realm and repressed jur juristic ethical thinking. Um, a conception of nature void of the exception emerged. Even the deists conceived of God as an engineer of a great machine, but now the machine runs itself. Um, Schmidt says um, the, quote, the general will of Rousseau, this is interesting because one of my students brought this up the other day, um, the general will of Rousseau became identical with the will of the sovereign, but simultaneously the concept of the general also contained a quantitative determination with regard to its subject, which means that the people became sovereign, thus dissolving the sovereign decision. He says at first in America, there were remnants of the sovereign decision through a pragmatic belief in the voice of the people as the voice of God. And he refers um, to de Tocqueville at that point in the text. Um, um, but in Schmidt's era and among neo-Kantians, he says democracy is, quote, the expression of a relativistic and impersonal scientism, a result of 19th century political theology. So again, political theology isn't just what happens in the um, 17th century or the 16th century, right? When when they're in the monarchical era, there is a political theology for the 19th century. It's just different. So when we're thinking about the ways that Schmidt uses the term political theology, um, he's using it as a way to describe what he thinks is metaphysically normative for a particular epoch in time. He says transcendence here then becomes imminence. Schmidt then predicts um, the result that in the future, conceptions of transcendence will no longer be credible to most educated people who will settle for either a more or less clear imminence, imminence pantheism or a positivistic indifference toward any metaphysics. <laughs> 
Now, all I need you to do is just ask yourself as you're watching this, whether or not Schmidt was right about that. When you think about the ways that you, the world you have grown up in, um, or the, your account of the world, maybe since Schmidt's time, since 1922, is it the case that right now, generally among humans, like not everybody, I mean, you'll have wild cards for sure, but generally our conceptions of transcendence no longer credible to most educated people. Do those educated people settle for a more or less clear eminence pantheism or a positivist indifference toward metaphysics in general, which might be an allergy or re completely rejection, re complete rejection of religion. Again, he's already writing in a time where people, later philosophers are going to call it the, the death of metaphysics. So um, I will say like uh, that, that Hannah Arendt, who is a critical theorist we will look at, um, refers by, um, uh, you know, just a gesture of words, right? Like to the death of metaphysics as that whole sort of, sort of process of what happens in the late 19th century. In contrast here, Schmidt says he turns um, with praise to the 19th century Catholic philosopher, philosopher Denosa Cortez, whom, of course, he, he admires. He admires because he says that Cortez saw this problem. He saw it early on um, uh, that, that, that it's not just the fact that, like, scientism or that the, the people have turned away from religion or Christianity is that in turning away from that um, and having a completely different metaphysical basis for things, they have left out a really, really important part of the social order, which would be sovereignty in Schmidt's conception and this particularly the sovereign's ability to decide on the state of exception. He characterizes Cortez as following Hobbes in praise of dictatorship, but claims that people have yet to appreciate him, Cortez. So he's going to go on to deal with Cortez and other thinkers in the last essay in the volume, um, which becomes part of his polemic um, and part of his justification for why um, we need to be thinking of dictators in the 1920s. So that is the right wing account. Um, of of this, I will do another video lecture on the last essay, um, just to round out and to complete the book. But this is uh, um, really the heart of, especially for an intro class, um, this is the heart of Schmidt's right wing argument. Um, we will return later on um, after I, so I'll do a video lecture on on uh, um, essay four here, and then we will look at uh, Lenin's book. Um, state and revolution um, and get a left-wing account. And then I think we'll be in a really good place to be thinking about what's really at stake for the emergence of critical theory in the 1920s with the Frankfurt thinkers. Thanks very much for watching. As usual, if you're getting you know, a lot out of this and you have the means, um, uh, this is the labor of love for me right now. I'm the only person who's running the Center for Critical and Cultural Theory in Denver. Um, and, uh, so we have a Patreon page and if you can, uh, if you can kick in money there or anything to support us, that would be great. If you're a student who's already paid for this for a university class, please do not in any way feel obligated to pay more money. You've already paid money for the class. Okay. We'll catch up with you in lecture four. Uh, have a great day, morning, evening, wherever, and whenever you are. Bye.